Good morning, everyone. Um, I wish I joined you in person. I wasn't able to. Um, miss my flight from Brussels, and so I'm joining you from Brussels. It's really cold in Europe. I don't know how you all survive this weather because <laughs> we're used to sunshine almost all year round. Um, so you'll excuse the very bulky dressing. Um, but I, I really, um, it's a pleasure to be on this call um, and to be able to share with you um, our learnings at the Lawyers Hub. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I would want to, you know, um, share my slides as we as we speak and just see how to, you know, connect what's happening in Europe around the AI Act, and to look at it um, globally. What you know, what this means for the rest of the world. Um, there have been talks about Europe being the, you know, the tech policy capital of the world. Um, in terms of developing legislation. Um, and um, of course, there's been, you know, a few comments made by um, officials at the at different EU institutions on the desire to export digital policy, especially in terms of Africa. Um, and so we'll try and look at what, what that means for the rest of the world in 15 minutes. That's a really short time. Um, but I will, um, I will try and, you know, um, make it make it possible. Um, if you want to know a bit more about the work that we do, and um, we've written a bit on what AI looks like within the African continent. Um, this year we run a festival called the Africa Law and Tech Festival, and this year the festival focused on um, on AI and AI policy specifically um, around the world and in Africa. So we did the event in Nairobi and also did it in Brussels and, and Paris. Uh, and we joined a few of you at Republica, um, which um, I think went, went really well. Um, and so um, if you go on YouTube, you'll be able to see the live stream. If you also go on lawyershub.org, um, you'll be able to see a bit more if you need to write more on you know, um, specifics that's happening across the African continent, then you'll be able to, to see that as well. Um, but I will try and rush through my slides and see what we could, um, you know, gain in the, in the process of this discussion. But I'm going to talk about the European um, AI Act and its possible effects on non-EU countries. Um, I will start from the process um, and let you know what I will see as pros and what we see as cons in this case. So this is just a bit more about what we do at the Lawyers Hub. Um, we work on digital policy and uh, we also work on startups. We work a lot with uh, tech startups and support them through their work. Um, and uh, you can find us on lawyershub.org. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter. Um, yeah, I think this will be shared with you. Uh, but I would want to look at the case for adoption of GDPR like laws in other jurisdictions. GDPR was um, a law meant for Europe um, and came into effect, I think, on 25th of May, 2018. Um, and it seemed like on, it only concerned the continent um, in, you know, of Europe and the 27 EU countries. But this has become like a gold standard of privacy in the world. Um, why? Um, let's look at tech companies. Big tech companies are looking at um, GDPR as if we comply with Europe, we comply with the rest of the world. And so without knowing it, it automatically becomes a law for the rest of the world. Um, so we see this extraterritorial nature of the GDPR because there, was, there hadn't been a comprehensive law um, across the, the world that would ideally cover issues on privacy. And so we've seen countries like Bahrain, Israel, Kenya, Qatar, you know, these countries coming up with very GDPR-like laws and some of them lifting off specific sections um, of GDPR, including Kenya, um, into their law. Um, also really coping what's happening in, in Europe, including the institutions, um, like, you know, um, the supervisory authorities um, to mirror what's happening in Europe in, into their countries. So we also have South Africa that passed its legislation um, fully last year and Uganda um, in 2019. We have Japan, New Zealand, Argentina and Brazil that have very um, similar legislations to GDPR. And what we see in this is the world was waiting for a comprehensive data regulation law and GDPR filled that gap. And I am aware that GDPR has very many um, weaknesses as a law. 
Um, and that is, you know, there are different quarters trying to fix that. We were at the um, uh, Data Supervisory Authority event in Brussels, I think in June, um, and a lot of the discussions are after GDPR, what next? Do you continue to amend the legislation to make it better? Um, and what do you do? Is it piecemeal? Is it, you know, an overhauling legislation in that sense? And so when you look at this, you see that there's two things. There is a data export effect, um, which they ideally call the Brussels effect of GDPR. And there's this extraterritorial nature of the GDPR. So looking at this means that there's a possibility that that will also happen with the AI Act. Because if you like politics, they say that power abhors a vacuum. Um, that when there's a vacuum, people will go for the person who looks powerful. And that is what will happen with the, um, with the EU, um, EU AI Act. So what's, what's happening in Africa? Just quickly, um, from the discussions that have happened in Europe, um, a few things have happened in, in Africa. Um, there's been, you know, tech global tech companies are, you know, especially from the global north, and we see this with the US, really building their technology um, and exporting it into, into Africa. Um, there were issues around Amazon and them supplying equipment to the US government in terms of uh, policing. Um, we will soon see that within the African continent, those solutions to, you know, um, the use of those solutions in public sector um, in Africa. There are studies already being done on how this, this, is, this is happening. But countries like Egypt, you know, in 2021 came up with an AI um, strategy. Rwanda came up with an AI policy, um, Mauritius as well. In Nigeria, they have now set up a national agency for research in robotics and artificial intelligence. And um, Ethiopia is convening, I think in two weeks, they are convening the African Conference on AI and the government has come up with a national AI institute to be teaching you know, on this. Um, Kenya in 2018, which was a bit early in the game compared to the rest of the continent, they commissioned um, the blockchain and artificial intelligence task force um, for them to be able to really guide on you know, what this means. And um, the head of this task force now is based in Brussels. He's the ambassador of Kenya to Brussels, which is very interesting um, considering what's happening um, right now. And so um, we know the objectives of the EU AI Act. Um, I think we've talked about it all week, um, but it's looking at legal certainty which is lacking from the rest of the world. How do you make it certain on how you work on AI? It's also looking at having this single market, uh, which the rest of the world is trying to harmonize its laws on, including Africa, on how to harmonize laws and just have one law um, on data flows, especially. Um, and also, we just must remember the risk-based approach that AI Act in Europe is taking, um, and the extraterritorial scope that we've talked about, that maybe it's going to be this law for the rest um, of the world. Um, so what are the pros and what are the cons? One, this is going to build international cooperation on AI. There is going to be conversations that people will come together and see what to do. The hottest discussion right now is on data flows, how data flows from one region to another. And so the AI actually possibly have an effect on this, you know, unjustified restrictions on AI flows. Um, and then also we look at how do we tap the potential of AI and address these global challenges? Because at the United Nations level, this has not been done. Um, cybersecurity discussions are already continuing. Um, and the world is looking at, you know, how do you have a global standard? Um, digital tax as well, there's been discussions around that. But for the AI Act, this hasn't been done. So um, how do you get to this? Maybe Europe has the answer. And then there will be at least some affirming of principles on openness. But what are the, the shortcomings? We've seen organizations like um, IDRI, uh, the European Digital Rights you know, groups and different, different organizations under it, coming together to talk about the fundamental rights that may be breached by the AI Act. Um, and then also this whole self-assessment, um, it really does not sit well with people. How do you certify self-assessment? Self um, and then finally, uh, there's been um, you know, um, concerns around individual harm, really over focusing on individual harms and overlooking societal harms to society around AI. And this maybe I would tie it into the approach that GDPR took on user, focusing on the user, that this is the user, they must exercise agency, we must protect the user, rather than looking at 
this is the societal harm that you ideally have on, on, on society, which is another topic for um, discussion for another day. So what are the two effects um, um, that this Euro European AI Act could have and could also do in terms of mirror mirroring the GDPR? Um, we have two things that, you know, we look at laws, what impact laws would have on. So the de, the, the de facto effect um, that it will really get us, get companies, you know, anti, anti multinational organizations like, you know, Facebook, Amazon, Twitter, um, the rest of the big tech companies um, to sort of standardize product and service, you know, so they will make their, you know, businesses, operations, processes easier, simpler, more open. But the de jure effect is that this would also have, you know, effect on other countries that their laws align with EU laws. Think of countries that the EU um, exports its laws to. Think of Francophone Africa in terms of France. Um, think of countries that were colonized by, by, by Europe that ideally really borrow legislation and laws from. And also companies from Europe are based in these specific countries. Um, so I'll give an effect of this de facto effect. You know, um, if you go on any website, uh, most of the big tech company websites, they've adopted GDPR as a default on their website. So they'll ask for your consent on how they process personal data in cookies. Because if they comply with Europe, it's easy to comply with the rest of the, of the world. Um, and so that's one of the de facto effects that this thing, this act has. Um, I am almost done, so don't worry. So based on this, it means that um, whatever effect GDPR had on, if citizens come from Europe, then you're going to adopt the GDPR standard for them. That will ideally happen for AI Act. And um, my prediction is that people will want to make it easy um, and say, you know what, we'll just comply with what Europe is doing. Um, I would want to um, go to, you know, what would be this effect on three effects. One would be on the national level AI governance. Since Europe began this discussion on AI Act, we've had the Canadian government come up with um, Bill C-227. We've also had Brazil in 2021 approve um, it's AI bill. Two, we have something called regulation creep, where multinationals would ideally adopt AI as a global AI, Europe's AI Act as a global standard for their companies. And also we'll have self-certification. We see with GDPR, we have institutions like IAPP, the International Association of Privacy Professionals, that then become a gold standard for certification on privacy because there's a law that has come in place that's, um, that's doing this. And then finally, just to raise the standards um, of privacy across. So what do we do? Knowing that Europe ideally develops digital policy, especially for the rest of the world, unknowingly, how do we take action and what do we do? One is to look at AI policy development and see that we actually develop good policy for both Europe and knowing that maybe it will have an effect across the world. How do we encourage that AI talent without necessarily restricting um, the growth of AI? And um, I belong to different European groups talking about standardization and what professionals will do in this, in this case. Um, and so there's need to deploy national AI strategies that would ideally favor development um, and look at, and, and, and you know, take cognizance of the fact that different parts of the world really are different stages of AI development. And so restricting AI um, products without necessarily thinking about development would be, would be restricted. We need to look at, you know, how do we handle health? How do we handle agriculture and places like that? Number two, there's need for policy contextualization. This is both for Europe and for the rest of the world. But just because Europe has a GDPR does not mean that California has to immediately pick up and have a California privacy bill when it's the home of tech companies, unlike really focusing on, on individuals. Africa also needs to look and say, can we contextualize policy without necessarily just lifting it off? Um, and my final comment on that would be, some African countries pick GDPR, set up data commission offices that are not independent, that are not funded because they don't have the same funding as the Europe, they don't have the same um, you know, independence as EU institutions have. And finally, I think that Europe needs to build more AI products without necessarily pushing for more AI policy. Um, America would build the tech products and Europe has figured out how to 
regulate those products for the rest of the world. But we don't see as many unicorns coming out of Europe, like Spotify is a great you know, company to look at. But if you look at tech unicorns, they are American tech unicorns. How do we in include you know, growth within this context and ensure that you know, Europe is ideally building tech products for the rest of the world that we change the world, um, including also its, its policy? So those would be my comments. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for having me and for the super warm welcome. I actually want to take you on a bit of a personal journey. And it's been great to have Linda as previous speaker. And I think I'll come back to a couple of things you've already heard throughout the week. So as just said in the intro, I'm currently working in industry. Um, I actually started in academia. I then moved into a big tech company's moonshot um, organization. I was with a startup and now I'm with a corporate. And what I wanna do with you in the next 14 minutes, 10 seconds roughly, um, is think through what does it actually mean to run an ethical AI business? Quick disclaimer, I'll probably leave you with more questions than answers because a lot of what I'm alluding to, I personally have the answers for myself, but I think the answers will be different for each of you, but let's have a look at it. So um, ethicality or ethics or trustworthiness is currently a bit of a mot du jour. So there are many organizations, most of them honest and well-intended, looking into what does it mean to be ethical or how do we make AI ethical? And here that's just a selection. Um, there's hundreds of initiatives, so on the left, this goes back a bit to my standardization work. Um, there you see the IEEE ethically aligned design series. So IEEE, one of the big international standardization organizations, is currently trying to develop standards which define how to ethically develop products. On the top, you see the logo of the partnership on AI to benefit people and society. It's a industry partnership. It started out very US centric, but by now is also global. Lower middle, you see the cover page of um, what back then was the draft ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI issued by the high level expert group on AI of the European Union. This has by now developed in the ELT AI framework, which in turn underlies the EU AI Act. And on the right hand side, um, it's one example among dozens. It's, for instance, the cover page of BMWs, so the car manufacturer's code of ethics for AI. When you have a look at these initiatives, you will see that it's always the same key concepts such as robustness, human agency coming back. But what I think is currently still, well, one could either say lacking or developing is thinking through the practical implications of what does it actually mean to adhere to these things in practice. So we have a lot of debate and a lot of honest and good thought about how ought we act, but what now needs to be done is to actually take all of these thoughts and all the things you heard over the last couple of days and put them into action. And once the rubber hits the road, um, you actually figure that this is anything but easy, but if you get it right, it can be highly rewarding. So what I now want to do with you is I want to have a look at different stakeholder perspectives and what you have to consider, either if you think about how to regulate AI or how to do policy, or if at some point in your life, you just feel the calling and you're like, yeah, I want to become either an AI entrepreneur or I want to run an AI business. Okay, so let's start with the entrepreneurs. I am convinced and I also experienced myself that in order to run a ethical business, and I think that holds for any kind of ethical business, um, but also for AI, you actually first have to be very certain what are your own ethical priorities and moral pillars. What do I mean with that? What I mean is you have to know yourself and your stance on very difficult questions quite well. I know that earlier this week, you already heard something about value ethics and utilitarianism. Do you actually know into which camp you count? So I, for myself, can say I'm actually more a value ethics guy. I do think that there are values which are incommensurable to each other. 
But I also accept that some people say, well, actually, we believe that um, you can quantify the objective goodness or the objective positive impact, or however you want to say it, of different aspects of the same thing. And then you can, in a way, sum up and trade off. Still, this makes a big difference for you and your decision making, because if you are strong in the value ethics stance, there might be certain things you will not do no matter what. If you're more a utilitarian, you might, putting it a bit caricature-like, sometimes say, well, the goals justify the means. Also, when you're thinking about what you want to do and where you want to take your product or your company, what is more important to you? individual or collective well-being. If you say individual well-being, you might very well find yourself in trajectories where you actually build products which optimize the well-being of a individual or of a small group, but which do not necessarily positively impact everyone. On the other hand, if you build collective well-being, so say population level approaches, for instance, in digital health, then you might very quickly find that your product is not efficient or efficacious on certain people. Still, on average, you improve things. Also, are there topics you want to address? So are there things which you think are more important to you? Is it climate change? Is it health? Is it um, equality in society? And then vice versa, are there industries you definitely do not want to serve? Neither in your product, nor as your clients, nor as your partners. And there's the usual suspects where many people have opinions. For instance, the security industry, the military complex, fossil fuel industry. Your personal answers to all of these questions will very much constrain what you as a manager or as an entrepreneur can do and want to do, and thus also what you can credibly represent and carry into a company. So if we now have a look then at companies, say you've settled this for yourself, you know yourself, you have taken your decisions there. Um, if you start a company, the thing everyone will ask you for, and also um, pending that external circumstances are not suddenly abysmal, what will carry your company is your business case. Think through that business case and think through it honestly. Why? because it then turns out that very often, particularly in how AI is currently done, um, certain business cases offer themselves more to being ethical than others. For instance, if your product or the service you want to develop on the technology side relies on data processing, and for instance, you need a lot of data for training a certain function, where do you get the data from? Can you get it in an ethical way? And there, what do I mean with an ethical way? Well, in the best of all cases, of course, you acquire data through explicit data collection exercises where you fully inform the data sources about the purpose of the data collection, about the purpose of what you're going to do with their data. And you also make sure that they fully understand what it means for them to give their data to you. Is that always feasible? Well. Realistically, if you now need millions of data points in order to train a complex machine learning system, either you need enormous resources because data subjects usually want to be compensated, or what currently is very often happening, you just make resource to publicly available data sets. Still there, the data subjects hardly ever were informed because at the point of collection, it wasn't even clear what you wanted to do with it. Similarly, and um, this also partially goes back to the discussion about the global self, it's not enough with having the data itself. For many machine learning applications currently, you need labeled data. How do you get the labels to this data? Well, either um, you go out there and you get a service provider who is employing people at decent conditions is making sure that they are not just working for a minimum wage, but that they actually are properly compensated for what amounts to gruesome work. So if you've ever done eight hours of data labeling a day, you know what I'm referring to. Or you just put it to one of the standard providers. You don't ask questions where the data labels come from, but you run with them. 
are you necessarily unethical if you don't ask questions? No, I don't think so. But are you running a certain risk of compromising your entire setup? Definitely. Also, next question, will you be able to serve all customer groups equally? And here, once again, Global South, um, it is much harder to come by health data from the Global South than from, say, the European Union and North America. Why? Because in the European Union and North America, you just have much more ICT-equipped healthcare services already now, which in a way means the data rich tend to get data richer. Still, if you only have data about Europe and the US, is it likely that your services and products will equally generalize to people or to institutions from the global south? No, it's not. And then important, and I already alluded to that before, and also in the conversation um, you had with Linda, where she referred to, we need more startup money. As a startup, if you need funding, with whom do you want to partner and under what conditions do you accept funding? So do you want to partner with venture capital funds who, for instance, get some of their money from a industry you previously decided not to work with? Or do you accept a risk capital injection under the premise that if your product fails, at least you can collateralize the data? So would you accept to sell data you collected previously in order to repay some of your risk capital debt in case your product fails? All of these are things you should think about before you embark on your journey. And then finally, having an ecosystem view. One of the key questions currently, and this goes back to what I said in the beginning about there is many organizations who are now developing AI ethics frameworks or um, policies. Are they actually willing to follow through? So also think about you as a potential entrepreneur or manager. All the answers you might have given to the questions on the previous two slides, are you willing to follow through on them once it really comes to you as a company in an ecosystem? Why might it be hard to follow through? Because, for instance, currently, there is not yet a market for ethical data and data labeling, which means that if you want to do these things at their real cost, if you want to pay people proper wages, if you want to inform data subjects properly, presumably you have to pay higher prices per data item or per label than everyone else who's relying on the existing infrastructure. Eventually that's gonna change. Once there is sufficiently many players who come with you, then economies of scale kick in. But for the moment, you probably are one of the trailblazers if you go that way and you pay a premium on top of it. And then finally, and this is also a big question, which um, in the context of the EU AI Act repeatedly is being discussed just from a different angle. As a company, are you really willing, and as an ecosystem, are you really willing to commit to transparency and public scrutiny? I do believe that in order to maintain the ethics standards you set at some point, you have to be willing to accept public challenge to them, and you actually have to show to the public that you do adhere to them. It's not enough to say, I have an ethics board, believe me, I'm ethical. But in order to really make this a thing, people have to see what it means. So um, wrapping up, message one, and I don't want to sound all doom and gloom. As you've seen on the questions over the last couple of slides and the few comments I've made about it, getting an ethical AI business going currently is hard both on a personal level, because you have to answer a couple of very uncomfortable questions for yourself, as well as a professional level, when it comes to funding sourceness, to business model, to being price competitive. Still, I personally, and so does an increasing number of people also in industry, believe it's very much worth doing it. Why? First of all, because it's the right thing to do. So this is a very personal answer, but I can say that it feels good, to try to do what I believe to be the right thing. And if you also believe that no, it's not all about the monetary revenue, it's also about the impact we leave, then you will also enjoy trying to work on ethical business models. Secondly, I actually believe, and there's growing evidence that it offers great business opportunities. 
if you indeed are ethical and trustworthy, that can be a strong, unique selling proposition. It can be a differentiator in the market. So imagine having a, say, social network, which would probably be trustworthy with the data and with the AI mechanisms and its recommendations. If you could publicly go out with that and, for instance, get an organization like the Open Data Institute in the UK to back you up on the trustworthiness, that would be an enormous PR and sales proposition contrasted to most other offerings in the market currently. And rolling from there, um, the efforts you put into building a ethical business. And the important part is you have to do that from day one. You can't retrofit ethics into an existing well-running organization. It's not gonna work. But the efforts you put in, if you're successful, the return on investment is disproportionately high, both, again, morally, because you can actually contribute to shifting the entire ecosystem, as well as economically. If this works and you can use trust as value proposition, you will be currently one among the few who can offer it. And as you see by the public discourse, trust and trustworthiness or ethicality is becoming more and more demanded. So long story short, yeah, it's brutally hard, but I actually think it's very, very much worth doing because it's just the right thing economically and morally. Thank you. End of monologue.